Hello, everybody, and welcome to the VC panel session. Uh, my name is Michael Brook, and I'm very happy to be moderating this channel, this uh, panel today. Uh, and uh, I hope uh, everybody is ready to uh, to go on. So we have today four uh, people uh, who have uh, uh, who will be joining us and giving us their views from various perspectives on investing into the fintech sector, in particular during these times of COVID, which has uh, uh, changed the situation quite a bit. Um, and we'll be exploring the various aspects of that. Uh, we have Aloke Advani from Eight Roads Investments, uh, Eva Law uh, from the Association of Family Offices, Tej Kapoor, Fosun Capital, and then Bonaventure Wong from Arabian Asian Investment Company. Uh, what I'd like to do to get started is to let everybody give a brief introduction of themselves, and uh, then we'll go into the Q&A. So uh, uh, how about Alakek, you going first, and don't forget to unmute yourself. Thanks very much, Michael. Um, firstly, I'm very happy to be here. Thanks very much for having me. My name is Alokek Gadvani. I manage the FinTech strategic investing team at Eight Roads. Eight Roads is proprietary capital backed by Fidelity, the large global asset manager. Um, and our job is to look at investments in the fintech space wherever there is some strategic angle back to Fidelity's international businesses, essentially outside of the US. So we look at the fintech space across Canada, UK, continental Europe, and all of Asia Pacific. Um, we set up this team in Q4 of 2018 We've made eight investments thus far, deployed north of $50 million of, of capital, uh, and continue to do so. But our reason for being is twofold. So we look for strategic impact of Fidelity International, and we look for financial returns. Um, we usually start with minority stakes in early stage companies, Series A's and B's, but given Fidelity's sort of key focus as a wealth and asset management company, we tend to keep those themes in the center and look at other things that sort of touch it around the periphery. Things like capital markets, direct tech, AI, um, blockchain capabilities, robo, digital distribution, et cetera. So very happy to be here. I'll stop there. Thanks very much for having me. Uh, thank you very much, Alakik. Um, Eva, could uh, we have a bit of an introduction from you now? Sure. Hello, everybody. It's Eva. I'm from uh, Association of Family Office and also from uh, Sage International. Uh, the association actually we gathered many single family office, multi family office, and some other institutional investor. And then we normally do two things uh, facilitating the club dude around this uh, very close to circle. And we also through our um, technical uh, committee and our specialists to offer uh, advisory services to. Uh, the family offices and maybe the solution provider that serves the family office. Well, CG International, uh, it's a company that uh, we manage uh, direct investing mainly in two areas. One is real estate, the other is fintech. And in recent year, actually, we see more and more money is um, actually pulling and allocating into uh, fintech and some other technologies, not just uh, financial technology. And then uh, we always, as a manager and club deal facilitator through direct investing, investing into uh, many uh, fintech companies. So uh, that's my brief introduction. Thank you very much, Eva. That was very helpful. Uh, Tej, how about giving us the view from India? Yeah, thanks, uh, Michael, and, and uh, <laughs> great to be here. Uh, among all the uh, really, really experienced investors here. Uh, so I, I represent Fosun RZ Capital. We are a global, uh, we are a global fund. We are about 1.3 billion um, asset under management. We invest in China, India, uh, US, and Israel. Um, in India, we have uh, started our uh, practice in uh, about four years ago. Now we have a total of about uh, 16 portfolio companies, and uh, out of which four are, uh, are fintech companies. Um, as you know, India has been doing um, extremely well in the fintech segment, uh, and a lot of opportunities are coming. As a matter of fact, we closed uh, we closed uh, one of our deals in the COVID period. Uh, it's a company called DotPay, um, which uh, which we closed. So fintech has been a, 
uh, has been a great sector for us uh, in India, and uh, we are super keen to invest more. And also, uh, we started looking at Southeast Asia, uh, particularly Indonesia recently. Uh, like uh, Alok, you know, we do uh, Series A, uh, Series B investments uh, mostly, and and you know, occasionally we'll even do seed. So we're looking for uh, good entrepreneurs who can uh, pitch their ideas. We are happy to back them up. And Fosun, as you know, is a large uh, group, so uh, we can support them through their journey um, if they want to raise more money uh, as they go forward. And uh, glad uh, to be here and uh, looking forward to the discussion, Michael. Thank you. Thank you, Taj. Uh, and last but not least, as we go around the world of uh, our panelists, uh, I think quite literally we're spread all over the world, so it feels like an around the world in 180 uh, seconds. <laughs> I'd like to ask Bonaventure, how about uh, giving us a brief intro to AAIC? Thank you, Michael. Um, my name is Bonaventure Wong. I'm the managed partner at uh, AAIC, an asset management focusing on Asia and Middle East uh, and North Africa corridor. We currently manage about $2 billion uh, with an ESG overlay with all our investment. Uh, currently have a TMT fund focusing on investing with a fixed income return. A uh, little bit of background myself. So I worked for JP Morgan and a sovereign fund in UAE for the last 25 years. Uh, fortunately, also sat on the family office uh, side as well, managing a family's $10 billion asset. Um, and then, of course, uh, with my startup uh, experience, I founded three telecom related companies as well. So I've got a little bit broad uh, view about the FinTech and as well as from an institution as, uh, as well. Thank you very much. Thank you Bonaventure. So I thought that maybe we'd get started kind of looking at the bigger uh, window, bigger picture over here, um, sort of globally. Uh, and um, Alakik, I was, w wanted to kind of get your views in terms of, if we, first of all, if we look at the global trends, uh, depending on who you look at, but according to FT Partners, who tracks deals, uh, they've uh, reported that fintech and financing in the second quarter have uh, been about 9.3 billion, which was the lowest since the beginning of 2018. Um, uh, so whether this is just a temporary blip or a long-term trend, uh, I'd be interested in understanding, getting your thoughts. I mean, is this just a function uh, that funds are holding back dry powder to make sure that they have enough for their portfolio companies, uh, in which case it might just be a shorter term aberration, or is this a indication of something that goes on and will be around a little bit longer? Well, that's a good question, Michael. Um, so firstly, you know, that, that's play the timeline a little bit, because I think it'll help frame some of the context. If we go back across five months, when everyone went into lockdown first in March, some point in March or early April, I think all the funds spent probably a month or so kind of battling down the hatches and just kind of making sure that their portfolio companies were well positioned. They had the right uh, uh, revenue opportunities in front of them, though they might have been delayed, but most importantly, what was the cash runways? what kind of cash, cash positions they had, what kind of burns they had, how, they, how were they able to sort of lend them those periods. I think coming out of that, the other part has been, and, and something that we were just talking about in advance of the session starting, uh, you know, people have been getting used to investing into companies without meeting people face to face. Now, I think some of that is happening, but a lot of them are based on longstanding relationships. You may have met this company a year ago, two years ago, you're sort of rekindling some of that and moving that forward. Um, but I, I don't think the, the last quarter is probably representative more of a sudden halt where people went in and looked at their portfolio companies. But I think we've seen a pretty healthy trend of companies getting funded. I think there's definitely a barbelling of good versus others where you see some of the money flowing into, but there's no shortage of funding coming into the market that we see. Um, I also think that over the next three months, we might see some of the exhaust coming off of you know, people holding back over the last quarter. Um, but, uh, you know, from our own perspective, uh, we funded two different deals over the last quarter. One into a new company in the rec tech space called Steeleye, the second, a follow on funding into a, a, our flagship investment in a company called Moneybox. Um, Moneybox also raised the, one of the fastest crowd funds we've seen where they raised 7 million pounds in two days. Um, so I think they, they, you know, we're not seeing real shortages of money coming into this space. 
Thank you. I was actually also wondering in the same FT uh, partners report that I saw, they had a chart in there that shows that the amount of uh, new money coming into lead rounds uh, has went down a little bit, but then has been climbing again. And I'm wondering, is that just because you know, best practices in a fund is you want to get a new lead in order to set the pricing, or is that you know, they were not clear enough in that chart in terms of whether it was that effect or was it actually new money coming into, you know, new players coming into the space? Are you seeing yeah. that happening? So I think we've seen both. Um, honestly, mm -hmm. where there's been a real need and a financing need, it's usually the existing players trying to get that done quickly. It's also funny when you read some of the news articles coming out on TechCrunch or otherwise, it's quite clear when they don't mention who the investors are, where the money's coming from. Um, so I think it's a combination of, of both. I think you're seeing both sides of that coin. Thank you. Um, I, so uh, let's take a step back from sort of the more institutional side of the investing um, and look at uh, the family office perspective. So. Uh, I'd like to get Eva's views on this because family offices typically have a uh, multiple agendas, I would say, Un unlike a straight uh, institutional investor, although the, in Fidelity's case, there's an absolute return as well as something that's strategic to Fidelity's case. But a lot of funds that are backed by institutional LPs simply look at the bottom line in terms of what their IRRs are. Uh, but family offices typically have additional considerations. So they're, you know, they have a longer time horizon. They're not looking at returning capital to LPs. Uh, they also have social environmental factors. So uh, Eva, I was wondering in your perspective on that in particular and how it relates to today's environment and as well as FinTech. Okay, I think uh, many of the family has created a wealth by building business themselves. So it's always makes sense that they would like to leverage their experience and also invest and grow their operating business. So family office uh, would like to okay invest into fintech that can really uh, that create values for their family enterprise. For example, within our network, many are the developers. So the next gen or even, okay, the first gen actually are very fond of investing into prop tech. Okay, so that's how they actually pick, okay, the technologies that they want to invest into. And they believe that they have the proprietary knowledge that will also enhance the likeliness of success for, for the investment. And uh, in terms of the investment uh, horizon, I think family office is a bit different from other institutional investors, particularly those of VC or private equity managers, because family office are not under pressure from outside investor to exit the deals. So while private equity firm typically own their uh, investment company normally for uh, five to seven years before cashing out, but family office can actually hold the investment as long as they, they need to. And they don't have a very explicit uh, time horizon that like other family, uh, like other private equity firm does. So the, the, the money, okay, it's sitting there and can hold on to money for a longer period of time. Are you also seeing any trends or any differences between uh, family offices mostly investing closer to home or do they have a more of a global perspective and uh, are interested in go investing outside of their home uh, territory? Uh, actually, they quite uh, uh, flexible. Okay, I see, okay, many of them investing in their home country, but many of them, okay, also, okay, actually have cross border acquisition as well, okay? And for their forms of investment is always uh, in a direct investment model, wider than a, a employing a fund manager, investing into a basket. But of course, there is an option, okay, available in the market that they will allocate money into this kind of portfolio. But talking about the size, uh, the substantial money go direct to, okay, the direct use. So that is always uh, the format, okay? And, and also, I would also comment in terms of being a financial investor, actually family office or the family enterprise is also like to 
uh, invest into technology company, okay, uh, to actually enhance, okay, their uh, competency of their house and their business. So it's not just, okay, about investing into, okay, a particular company, just uh, expecting that company generate alpha, but they would like to leverage that kind of direct investment and the inferences or the proprietary information that they can get access to through holding these kind of investment, particularly through uh, majority stack control, okay, that they can really use the talent within that technology company that can really enhance the business. That's what I, okay, uh, learn, okay, and, and see that is how they will pull the money into this kind of company. Thank you. That's that's actually very interesting. Uh, so I think uh, at the next uh, direction we're going to look at is uh, India, which of course uh, this is uh, your your uh, bailiwick, Tej. And as you said earlier, India's I think is especially interesting given the rapid changes that have been taking place. Um, it, it's really been probably one of the quickest transformations in terms of going from traditional to uh, uh, really a de deploying technology. And a lot of it has to do with the government, of course. I think uh, there's been the, the things like the identity, the Aadhaar identity, the banking inclusion, demonetization, and on and on. You'll get into more details on that. And of course, then you look at the companies like Geo, which people are talking about because their role as well in terms of digitally connecting the whole country really establishes an interesting infrastructure uh, for transformative innovation. So. How, how do you see this developing and how do you see the interplay and the balance between you know, what the government is doing to set a, essentially an industrial policy and economic policy together with the private sector, which you're more representative of as, as well as sort of being you know, a foreign player in all this. And we'll get more into the global aspects in the f later because that's, a, that's sure. a whole topic of its own. Mm, yeah, yeah, no thanks Michael. And, uh, and like you rightly pointed out, I think one thing uh, I can have a one up on my Chinese colleague is actually the uh, fintech sector. Um, and, uh, you know, we have UPI, uh, which, by the way, just to give you some numbers, uh, they did uh, 40 billion worth of transactions last month, 1.4 billion, um, sorry, 1.4 billion transactions and 40 billion worth of transactions. So it's, it's, it's phenomenal. Um, wow. And I, like you said, you know, just going rolling back, um, you know, just a few years ago. I think there were two or three things which I really want to highlight, which you know changed the game for. And I've been investing in India for about ten years, um, and uh, you know one was the UPI was a big game changer, uh, where all the banks came together and said we will not charge any fee for people to transfer money, um, which has, I don't think has been done in any country, um, you know, of significant, you know, any large company, large country, because you know in in China, as you know, Ali Alipay has its own ecosystem. WeChat is own, you know, they don't talk to each other really. Um, then I think, like you mentioned, uh, President, uh, I mean, Prime Minister Modi with his uh, with his uh, you know the the banking program where he got a lot of people uh, into the banking, uh, you know, remit was also. Uh, rolled out in his um, in his first term, uh, which got a lot and lot of people into the uh, into the banking, and uh, third, as you all know, uh, is Geo, and um, you know Geo with their scheme of uh, giving free internet to um, to the nooks and corners, uh, you know, which changed the game, um, and um, so India suddenly went from a very data poor country to a very data rich country, um, and uh, all these three were sort of the enabling pillars to it. Um, so all credit to, like you said, the government um, and then uh, the private enterprises, uh, particularly Geo, you need, a, you need a market mover. And I think uh, we all know uh, Mr. Ambani can move many markets. So, uh, so here he was, you know, uh, and you know, as a result, what has happened is uh, there are a lot of innovation that has been happening. If you look at H1 2020, um, you know, India has, you know, Indian private investing has raised about 4 billion US dollars out of which 1 billion and again gone into fintech sector. Um, and there, you know, in, if you take uh, lending, if you take uh, wealth management, if you take savings product, if you take player like cred, um, you know, credit card based products, everywhere there is so many opportunities to unlock, uh, which are all running off these rails, which were, uh, which were you know, put into place uh, by, you know, things I just mentioned. On top of it, I, I think, um, you know, we all know, 
uh, while we were in the shutdown, um, you know, Geo raised 20 billion US dollars, which by the way was equivalent to the entire money raised by the VC industry last year. <laughs> so I think the lockdown was <laughs> really helpful and uh, it was, things were buzzing at Reliance. Um, so that's going to further unlock, uh, Michael. I don't see that as a bad thing. I think it's a very positive thing. I think it's going to really, really unlock another layer of, um, you know, like, you know, he wants to take a lot of the offline grocery online. You know, like I was mentioning, uh, our, our financial, the investment we have made in a company called Dot Pay, uh, they are doing contactless ordering. Uh, so COVID is another big, like demonetization was a big push towards, uh, uh, towards the digital payments. I think COVID has done that to India again. Um, I mean, it's very bad for some of the offline, you know, retail, you know, restaurants, et cetera, but for, for lending and FinTech and any sort of, you know, any, any gamut of uh, FinTech play you are in, you are benefiting. India has also seen the growth of largest DMAT accounts uh, to trade on public markets ever, um, you know, in last two to three months. So overall, I think this is a great, um, uh, COVID has thrown a great opportunity. Obviously it's struggle, but a great opportunity uh, remittance businesses are also rethinking, even as the migrant workers are going from one place to other. So we can talk a lot more, but uh, but I mm. see this uh, as as a positive uh, for fintech industry yeah. in particular. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll we'll come back to that because I I I you know I think the last decade we've seen you know sort of China taking the lead in terms of technology and payments with Ali and WeChat Pay, and you know it really is beginning to feel like India is going to be the the story of the next decade because the infrastructure that's been set in place coupled with in, amazing talent pool of tech, technologically uh, you know, capable people, the engineering and, and entrepreneurial spirits. Uh, so I, I, I think yeah. that's going to be a very, very interesting place to play. And Super exciting. Interesting, uh, very, very sure. exciting. Uh, let me move on now to Bonaventure and kind of take the conversation a little bit back to sort of family offices, uh, since your asset management firm is focused on that. And, uh, the question to you is, you know, do you feel that the family offices have the correct or the right skill sets to invest in sectors that are new to them? Obviously, like fintech being one of those, you know, how do you think they should be looking at the investment process based on in terms of the portfolio, you know, in terms of sector, check size, which round to participate in, geographic coverage, uh, stage of the company, et cetera, et cetera, you know, that whole thing. And is this something they could do on their own or should they be looking for help in terms of how to navigate that. Uh, okay. Um, the yeah, process this is for Bon. Sorry, this is for Bonaventure. Sorry. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Since we have to give him a chance to speak, but you have to get off mute. <laughs> yeah, I'm off mute. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Eva. No problem. Thank you, Michael. That's, um, yes, I think the family office and the questions about the process, um, not only the family office, but the VCs itself, uh, they're mostly focusing on their portfolios. So family offices are already invested in FinTech. They're going to be putting more time and resources to help those that are in their own portfolio. So that's uh, a good sign, I think. Um, so, but then it's the negative sign of it is that seed money early stage uh, has been has slowed down dramatically across the board. Uh, we've seen a huge decrease on that. Um, the reason is is because of uh, the actual you know limit, uh, trans you know, um, aviation being locked down, airports being locked down, visiting and such. But I think uh, overall, the due diligence process of uh, these uh, investments have actually shortened than ever before. I think that's pretty uh, exciting using you know, the technology as we are doing a virtual, um, uh, a lot of these due diligence are done virtually now. Um, you know, Sequoia even uh, did a walkthrough a warehouse all on a phone camera um, and invested $20 million. Um, but of course, that, what that means is that I uh, you know for, for someone like Sikora and anyone else institutions, uh, we do see a lot of B and C round uh, funding itself. So for our family office, we've, uh, and also for our TMT fund, we've actually been focusing on uh, the debt side with mezzanine uh, convertibles, uh, because that really puts in perspective some kind of return in, in a very short period of time. I think family offices are looking for that. Um, less of it's just straight equity. I think valuation has always been a, a gap between you know, the investor and the actual uh, company itself. But um, yeah, I, you know, since even the seed investment back to seed investors has slowed down, I saw that a lot of accelerators has actually increased in application for four times than last year. 
Um, so has the money moved towards uh, those kind of, uh, um, kind of uh, lo looking at the pipeline deals through these incubators itself? So. Thanks. Uh, so I'd like to actually pick up on a point that you just mentioned, Bonaventure, and Alakaki did as well, which is the ability to close investments uh, effectively virtually. Um, I'm looking here, we have about 100 people already on this call, and I'm sure some of them are entrepreneurs or leadership of companies that are looking to uh, tap into the market to get more funding. Are there any uh, examples that you could give of things as advice of what works, what doesn't work, because we are in the kind of a new world relative to you know how people pitch and how they do due diligence and go through the entire investment process. So I kind of open this up to whoever, uh, since maybe Alokik, you mentioned this first and Bonaventure you did as well, but one of you can take the first yeah. crack at this, you know, wor words of advice and wisdom from the investor's standpoint to uh, <laughs> the, the companies that are looking to you to get in your investment. I'm happy to start and then I'll, I'll turn over to Bonaventure. The, um, look, I think, I, I think the hardest part about not being able to meet people in person is the trust element. How do you build the trust virtually? Right? And you can have enough phone calls and enough Zoom calls, but you need to build that trust and, and belief when you look into someone's eyes and believe they're going to build this business and make it a success, right? So, so the, the advice to the entrepreneurs is a few things, right? One is be really, really authentic in your pitch. Don't come too scripted. Don't come too canned. Don't come too prepared, but just be authentic in your pitch and what you're doing and your passion for the space. I think the second one is really, really know your stuff, right? whether it's your total addressable market, your numbers, your reason for being, what pain point are you solving, et cetera. And if I think about third is, is get it across in the most coherent and simplest manner because you don't have you know, 80 slides and, a, and three meetings to go through before you're gonna get it across. So, so get it across as crisply and coherently as you can. Um, I, I think those are, the, those are sort of simple points, but I think they can probably resonate because that authenticity needs to come across and the, the belief in the individuals needs to come across, especially when you look at early stage deals like we do. So. Good advice. I, I, yeah, I totally agree to look uh, about that. I think also important that we, we as uh, investors tend to look a lot of uh, opportunities. So we kind of a little slow in getting, so it's important you do get it across to us very quickly. Um, but I, I, I do see hopes there. I mean, these, uh, you know, for, forcing us all to look at a different way of uh, investing has given us the reason why we're doing this, especially this uh, webinar for this event virtually and, and all these investment side. But I, I do think this will continue uh, for a bit um, and it might continue for much longer. Uh, it's just, you know, we're very comfortable doing Zoom um, in many of our meetings than getting on the plane. From an ESG point of view for us, it's pretty good. We can save money, <laughs> we, no, no flights. Uh, hotels, well, you know, hospitality might go down, but, uh, but from a FinTech, I think technology has really have proven themselves uh, yet again. Okay, that's very, very, very helpful, thanks. Um, so at this point, I'd actually want, want to sort of step back and look at a thing, I, I guess it's kind of the elephant in the room in a sense, because what we're seeing, you know, we talked about, you know, the different regions, and um, it feels that there, uh, it's more than feels, I think it's a fact that the world is backing off sort of from its uh, globalization and free flow of investments. And, bec and, and although, you know, funds are very often regionally focused, but uh, there are new concerns that are coming to the forefront, like national security, data sovereignty, and of course the COVID-19 situation has just accelerated that trend. Um, and you know, there are differences already taking place. Uh, you know, China has got its own payment systems, so WeChat and Alipay, and now India is about to emerge as a major new digital infrastructure payments. You know, uh, and you know, there's been a recent paper which we were talking about before. You know, the the strategy, uh, view of the four internets. You know, U.S., China, India, the rest of the world, sometimes referred to as a splinter net. Uh, so if you're looking at it, and this is a question for all of you, but we'll take it in turn. If you're looking at investing, so for example, Ted, you're working for a Chinese fund investing in India. Uh, and, you know, there's also corporate investors. So you're an institutional investor, but you've got Tencent and Ali and Google and Facebook, you know, pretty much many of them who invested in Geo. Uh, 
you know, what are your thoughts about this? How is this going to change the way investments takes place? Um, uh, what are the sort of good and the bad that uh, you're seeing out of this? So it's a bit of an open-ended question, but I thought we'd get a bit of a discussion going on this. So uh, I don't yeah. know who wants to take this first. Sure, I can, uh, I can start and then uh, uh, you can. So, you know, I, as you rightly said, Michael, there is a, uh, obviously a, you know, anti-China sentiment that has set in um, and, you know, it's uh, become a little difficult to invest in India for Chinese investors uh, you to go through government approval process, um, which just uh, creates a bottleneck. Uh, but, uh, I, you know, rightly so, the Indian government wants to know where the money is coming from. Um, and, um, and, you know, we follow that process. Uh, so we have one of our investments, uh, which is waiting uh, in the process right now. Um, so, and all, all, you know, there, is a, there was a great connect that was building between China and India. Um, uh, there was a lot of participation from Alibaba, Tencent, um, as well as Fosun. Um, and more than that, there was exchange of information between the, you know, Chinese entrepreneurs and Indian entrepreneurs. And I think India sort of relates more to China in a way that scale from the scale point of view, because, you know, US has 300 million people. Um, but obviously there is the geopolitical tension, which, which always remains between India and China. So uh, that plays uh, really badly into, you know, what tech entrepreneurs would like to see, you know, is more participation. So I think both, both sides of tech entrepreneurs want to work with each other. And I think uh, once things uh, calm down on the border, then hopefully you can, re you can revive some of that, maybe not at the same pace, it might be a slower pace, but uh, I'm, I'm sure uh, we'll figure out a way to work with each other. Um, on the other side, you know, with the U.S., India has always had a superb, uh, uh, you know, sort of connect, especially when it comes to the tech side, you know, all the top CEOs, uh, you know, as you know, Satya or, um, you know, at Google, Sundar Pachai, you know, and all, you know, all the tech companies have top guys who are Indian. So they automatically, you know, sort of understand India. Maybe they were, they left India 15 years ago, but uh, it comes naturally to them. So. It is very, uh, I, don't, I don't see, uh, Google announced they're gonna invest eight or $9 billion out of which four has gone to Geo, which uh, every startup guy is saying, why, why, why did that happen? You know, it should have come to us. Um, but, uh, but I think so every, everybody's looking at uh, these big guys, uh, the big uh, four tech companies out of US to invest in India. Um, so that, that's gonna continue um, and which is a great news. And some of the Indian companies, unfortunately, a lot of unicorns that we have do not make money, right? Or uh, versus China where Ali and Tencent uh, were like profitable. So we don't see a lot of um, acquisitions of smaller companies. I think that might change in about a couple of years uh, when some of our, com some of the Indian companies get profitable. Um, and also there will be, if you look in the future, there will be some relationship with China, uh, which will be there. Uh, so I think Indian entrepreneurs are sitting uh, in a very sweet spot because everybody knows that India is the next big market. Um, and, um, and that's why, you know, I think that will cut across the borders uh, in different way. Uh, obviously everybody is becoming more nationalist as you were saying. Um, uh, so there'll be more, I mean, the, all the ministers in India have, uh, have said it very loud and clear, including, you know, banning TikTok, et cetera, that the entire data has to be in India. So there is this, uh, this, you know, nationalism that is there, again, rightly so, uh, that if it is my country data, why should it go out? And I think we are seeing that uh, in Europe as well, in US as well. Uh, so that will continue. I, I think it's tech wars. Everybody wants to have uh, the biggest tech games. I mean, it's no longer um, war with bullets. Uh, so everybody wants to own the best tech in the world. Um, I, I, I personally believe India is sitting um, you know, in a very good spot uh, to take this next 10 years with the talent you mentioned. Um, and the money supply that we have uh, to grow. So some of this, uh, you know, they will play both in my opinion uh, to get the best for, for Indian market. If, if I you. may add to that, I think there's, please, there's, please there's, a, there's a slightly sort of larger perspective, I think, which is important here, right? Which is, as you were mentioning, sort of the, the four ways of the internet for now, US, Europe, China, India. Um, I think the, if you take the, the sort of the, the impact that the US has had on inbound investment coming in through their CFIUS rule. I think that's gonna be interesting and seeing whether similar types of regulation will arise in different countries to, to sort of further the protectionism. I think beyond that, the other elephant in the room that people aren't talking about is the, uh, 
is kind of the, the, the Senate hearings that took place in the US, which were the four big behemoths and everyone touts them as the models were being held to task um, on data, on protectionism, on anti-competitive efforts, et cetera. And there's a huge push from several different parts of you know, good or bad or, or will happen or not to kind of break down some of those businesses and the dominance that they have. Um, and so I think that there's, if you look at that impact from the US side of it, and then the China impact with Ant, Tencent, uh, you know, Ali and others, there's, there's this, this, the pressure is coming from both sides with these behemoths and kind of trying to dominate different parts of the equation. I think to the point that Tej was making, you know, the India unicorns and decacorns aren't quite the same size scale and, 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 and strength that from the other countries yet. And in Europe, you've seen limited amounts of those companies being created. Uh, but again, no, nowhere close to size, strength or scale. Um, so I think there's still more to be played for here, but I do think there will be regulation driving it and largely driven by data privacy concerns. You know, Europe is very much at the forefront of that data privacy angles, whereas places like China are still completely open data within the walls of the country, right? So, so I think you have a, 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 a sort of views that sort of split up where in one way people are trying to think about is it a service I wish to do and what is the data implication of it? Or in another context, the, the data implication is irrelevant because the service is providing me with something that I didn't have before. And I think those two arguments are what's gonna drive some of the proliferation of, of, of FinTech. I also think the FinTech angles that have been really interesting is in the, in the middle of lockdown, FinTech and the use of FinTech products have only gone up exponentially because no one's using cash of any kind for anything, right? So, so the- Except for uh, Hong Kong, I have to say. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know, for, for payments, for, for uh, automated, you know, remittances, transfers, I mean, whatever it is, you couldn't go into a bank. So you may as well do it all online, right? So, so I think that's, and, and mobile. So I think that's the part that's, that's getting a lot more traction. Um, and so it's one of the industries where you can see whether it's payments, it's lending, it's wealth or insurance, it's all booming because people are doing stuff and they have time to do it because they've been locked down for five months. Yeah, you know, it's interesting what you're saying. You know, there's there's so much irony in the fact that on the one hand, the U.S. is lamenting that they're, uh, you know, being outcompeted and losing uh, leadership in certain technology sectors, and at the same time, they haul the four most successful companies in for hearings and beat the crap out of them. I mean, that that that's like, I'm sorry, it's a very schizophrenic way of looking at it. You know, so you want to be successful, but don't, but don't get too successful, or you're in trouble. Uh, so. One of the other things I wanted to dive into, and I know we're running a bit low on time, we've got about six minutes left, is we've talked mostly about India, the US, um, and uh, China, of course, but uh, I'd like to touch real briefly uh, to get a perspective on, for example, Bonaventure is based in the Middle East, and also, Ted, you mentioned Southeast Asia. Uh, your thoughts on those two regions, because we haven't covered them, and uh, since we were trying to get around the world, at least uh, get a global view on this. I uh, wanted to get your thoughts, but eventually anything that you're seeing that's uh, interesting in terms of development in sort of the Middle East, North Africa area? Yes, I, I think for us, because we kind of concentrate on the Middle East, North Africa and uh, Asia corridor, uh, specifically Middle East and Asia, uh, there has been uh, kind of investment strategies been looking at cross border more um, to kind of diversify asset allocation, not only the asset, you know, uh, but also jurisdiction as well, uh, because they're seeing the emerging market as being the biggest, and you know, looking at India and China growing, these are the two biggest markets. They're in those there in those market, those jurisdictions, sorry, regions. Um, so uh, for the Middle East investors, they don't invest. Even you look at the sovereign funds, they are about two percent. Um, you know, you know, this is a big thing for Adia in investing in geo in India. Um, that's a huge, uh, you know allocation of their portfolio into these regions. Uh, family offices around this region, I mean, they're very liquid. Um, it's just that don't have opportunities. And that's the fault of our, uh, you know, investment banking distribution channels is that they've been, you know, Middle East has always been looked after the, the, by the European office or the New York office. Um, Asia has always been looked after by uh, their own regional office and uh, they don't have presence over the Middle East. So deals that cross border those regions tend to end up with the worst deals uh, that no one else wants in the rest of the world. So I think that's the uh, opportunity for a lot of the, and uh, a lot of the entrepreneurs and fintechs is to look at these markets because they are the fastest growing markets now. 
and especially in the Islam, uh, Islamic uh, fintech is quite exciting to look at. Um, so it really uh, bridging that and bringing the capital across to these opportunities is really the key factor here. So, yeah. Taj, any thoughts about Southeast Asia since you mentioned it earlier? Uh, yeah, Michael, so we uh, keep it short. I think we just uh, started looking at it. Uh, Indonesia seems to be a clear uh, scalable uh, market among all the players. And I just want to sum it up in, in a way, you know, I feel like a Chinese uh, when I go or look at Indonesia businesses because now I feel how Chinese feel when they look at India because the size is so small, right? <laughs> so you, when you look at them and you, you say, oh, you know, the, you don't have Paytm of India or you don't have this on it. So there's a, a, a lot of, again, uh, talent is a problem in Indonesia. Uh, a lot of Indians are going there. A lot of Chinese are going there and creating businesses with local partners. Um, so I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's it, the, the good news is the GDP per capita in Indonesia is double of India. Um, so you could, and actually there are some scalable companies which are profitable. Uh, you know, one of, one of a couple of them are getting there so they can acquire other companies. So, but yeah, nowhere scale of India or China, but uh, very interesting markets. Um, to look at. Just a, just a quick observation on, on Southeast Asia, Michael, I think the, the interesting part I feel there is like the proliferation of fintech in every country around the world. It starts in payments and lending and then sort of proliferates from there. I think the next wave to come there is sort of wealth and insurance is going to be really, really interesting. I think starting with some of the more basic products that have worked in other geographies. I think the other part you do have, besides the, the behemoths coming in from other countries, you have the local behemoths of, of Grab and Gojek and Grab just announced three new financial products. So so they it, it's, it's kind of interesting to see the you know, sort of how are the upstarts and new startups that are going to come up and, and try and take space in those places when you've got some dominant in sort of new incumbents as well. Thanks. Um, I think we are, uh, I think we have about three minutes left. So let's see if we can get through this one. I mean, one of the areas that I think come where sort of the more traditional institutional funds and family offices uh, might have opportunities to do things together is in the area of sort of uh, family offices that also have a traditional business that they're looking to uh, create more digital, uh, essentially move it to the digital world, uh, digital transformation as, as, as is very often called. And there are various ways that they could do this. You know, they could develop a CBC model where they have their in-house uh, investment vehicle, in-house accelerator. Uh, and, you know, at some point as the business grows, they may want to bring in institutional investors to fund the growth of this business. So I was wondering if everybody had some like some thoughts in terms of uh, which model they believe worked better if you're a uh, existing business looking to deploy capital that also has a strategic element to this uh, for their own business and then at the same time also put it up so that it not only benefits the business but could also generate some nice return through an exit which usually means you do want to bring in the institutional investors. Uh, I, I'm happy to start there because that's what we do. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> okay. The, the, um, it's sort of interesting, right? Because I think that each investor needs to sort of figure out what they're bringing to the table. I think this is what we advise every startup, that when you're looking at raising money, you can raise money. And then if, you're, if you have choice, then you've got to decide who's bringing something for you. What are they bringing? Is it access to different geographies? Is it access to different kinds of clients? Is it access to technologies? Um, is it their experience of building up companies, helping to exit them, uh, or is it strategic linkages as well? So, so I think the the key part that's important when you have strategics come in in different ways. And, and when I say strategics, it's not so much like you know just a corporate coming and putting money, but someone who's a thoughtful strategic investor um, coming in is is are they able to bring more than the capital, and how are they able to do that? Do they bring in real domain expertise? Do they bring in experience in particular geographies, etc. But I do think it's important alongside some of those sort of CVCs to also have um, other uh, institutional investors, VCs, PE type investors along, along different stages um, because they're bringing different aspects to the companies. So in almost every deal that we do, um, even though we may be the first institutional money and we'd like to syndicate some of that either in the same round or next rounds, and we also co-invest alongside other institutions as well. So, so I think that balance is really healthy for some of the companies because to get the the strategic angles, the financial disciplines, the experience, domain expertise across different types of investors is hugely powerful. 
Thanks. That's that's uh, interesting. Any, any other thoughts from any of the other panelists on this? Eva Bonaventure, since you both work with family offices as well. Yeah, I'll, I can add to that. I think the family offices um, they do have the lack of understanding a lot of their fintech kind of like areas sectors, and I think that that's where a lot of uh, opportunity to help these family offices to kind of bridge that across um, through. I think accelerators are a good way of, for them to plug in and look at that as a very early st stage. Um, so, you know, the bigger family offices will be able to go to the BEC round. Uh, so, but they're never the anchor. There's always someone, uh, institution will kind of come bring that along. But we do see a, a big change. These family offices are getting bigger. They're getting, you know, they're hiring people with the expertise. Um, and I think more so now because they saw that in how, uh, especially the technology and FinTech, you know, as Alok said, you know, we're using more of our applications, mobile uh, has, feel that uh, this is where we should be putting our money. They're not leaders, they're always the followers. Um, and it really relies on institutions to be the leaders, uh, understanding where the market's moving and such. So those are the good things and the bad things. And uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Well, it looks this, this, this time passed very, very quickly and we have hit our time allocations. So we'll be in the lounge for anyone that might have questions in the virtual lounge. Uh, so thank you all of all of you for uh, this. It looks like we lost Eva. So, uh, uh, but uh, for the three of you, Tej, Bonaventure, and Alokik, thank you very, very much. This has been very, very interesting. And uh, uh, we'll talk thank again you, soon. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael, for hosting us. And yeah,